Certo. E devo dire che avete anche risposto positivamente alle mie attese, perché particolarmente interessante anche, anche in considerazione della sede dove ci troviamo, come avete già premesso. E già credevo fosse impossibile accostare Nerone e Adriano, voi siete riusciti addirittura a metterci Ercole. Quindi voglio dire abbiamo fatto l'unplain. Uh, Andiamo avanti a questo punto, uh, io però non ho le note di coloro che sono assenti, bene, Brando Stewart Green c'è? Sì ci sono. Mi sento sono udibile? Grazie. Puoi sentirmi? Beh, allora mi allontano. Buongiorno, sono udibile? Va bene. Um, buongiorno a tutti, uh, grazie mille a tutti i partecipanti per um, una serie di interventi molto stimolanti. Um, mi dispiace che non posso essere là di persone a discutere, um, ma due settimane fa ho avuto un incidente uh, sulla pista di sci e uh, non posso andare al negozio uh, e sicuramente non a, a Tivole. Um, ma... Devo ringraziare um, il Comitato in, uh, Scientifico per il gentilissimo invitato da presentare la mia ricerca. Um, per me un canadese appassionato per l'antichità è un grande onore um, da presentare qui in questa sede storica e con la presenza di tanti studiosi uh, ben noti dalla ricerca. Um, dato che uh, sono stato fuori d'Italia per 16 mesi e il mio italiano è un po' uh, legnoso, spero che uh, perdonerete la presentazione in inglese. Um, and now I, I switch to English. Uh, well, thank you everyone. Um, my talk this afternoon centers on a period of seemingly unending crises, a period of pandemic, of political instability, of economic anxiety, refugees, and previously unthinkable military invasions. If this all sounds too familiar, I should make clear that I'm not talking about the present moment and our post-COVID reality, but rather the ancient world and Rome's turbulent third century. This period between the end of the Severan dynasty and the innovations of the Tetrarchy is variously known as the military anarchy, the age of the soldier emperors, or as the title of a landmark 2015 exhibition at the Musee Capitolini, L'età dell'angoscia, the age of anxiety. Uh, one of the apparent paradoxes of this era is that its most stable and longest ruling emperor presided over the absolute worst depths of the crisis. While many of his predecessors only lasted a few months before succumbing to murder, plague, or battle, Publius Licinius Ignatius Gallienus held on to power for a full 15 years, from 253 to 268, first as co-regent with his father Galli uh, Valerian, and later as sole Augustus. The turning point was the tragic years 259-260, when Valerian was shamefully captured by the Parthians, Gallienus' son, the Caesar Saloninus, was murdered, and usurpers seized control of massive territories in both East and West. The Roman world had never been more precarious. A second seeming paradox is that this period of heightened crisis coincided with an apparent efflorescence of art and culture that has been, not without some controversy, described um, first by Gerhard Rodenwald as the quote, Gallienic Renaissance. Today, it is generally agreed that the 250s and 60s saw a renewal of uh, plasticity and an enhanced taste for classicizing forms in both portraiture and relief sculpture. Uh, this is certainly the case in the emperor's own portraits, but also in uh, private portraiture, as you see here. But the extent to which this constitutes a renaissance and what role, if any, was played by Gallienus is a matter of some debate. In its mildest formulation, the Gallienic Renaissance is characterized as a natural change in fashion, 
a general reaction to the rugged realism and bold expressionism that had characterized the art of the previous decades. In its strongest iterations, however, like that first endorsed by Andreas Alfoldi nearly a century ago, it was a deliberate cultural program driven from the center by the personal will and ideologies of a distinctly Philhellenic emperor. Now, I personally think that the stylistic developments and the various artistic phenomena of this critical period in the history of Roman art are too complex to be attributed to the efforts of one man. However, that doesn't mean that Gallienus did not have an ideological program. And indeed, his self-representation seems to be the result of much thought and deliberation. Uh, two points are worth emphasizing at the outset. Uh, first, that his portraits on coins and in the round represent a conspicuous break with the stylings of his predecessors, including and perhaps especially his disgraced father. And um, this rupture is perhaps just as striking as those that Dottoressa Buccino has just uh, demonstrated for images of Nero and Hadrian. Um, second, uh, his self-presentation is intensely retrospective making use of iconographical models from many centuries earlier. These include most obviously Augustus and Alexander the Great, but also as I hope to demonstrate today, Hadrian and more curiously, the Emperor Nero, the two subjects of the present conference. As Professor Gallimberti explored in his paper yesterday, those two emperors were the most prominent exponents of a, uh, a, another aspect that clearly flavored the Gallienic program, namely uh, Philhellenism. There is indeed ample, ample evidence that Gallienus was a conspicuous Philhellene. As a starting point, Alfoldi and others have pointed to a passage in Porphyry's Life of Plotinus that suggests that the great philosopher was sort of a, an in-house uh, in court philosopher um, at the uh, palace of Gallienus and his wife Salonina. Um, an anecdote about an imported project to build a city of philosophers in Campania called Plotinopolis has the virtue of coming from this contemporary source but it's ultimately difficult to judge what relationship really existed between emperor and philosopher. And in general, I follow Salvatore Settis in thinking that Plotinus and his philosophy are not ultimately a useful guide for understanding the art of the third century. I'd prefer to start instead with a suggestive passage from the Historia Augusta, um, a source which obviously needs to be used with some care, but which remains our most extensive historical source for the reign of Gallienus. It describes the emperor's visit to Athens, probably in 264, and claims that he was not only made Athenian citizen, um, but also held the archonship. Um, it notices that he took part in sacris omnibus, and that's generally been interpreted to mean that he was initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries, the first emperor to do so since Commodus, and the last until Julian the Apostate. And this connection with Eleusis seems to be confirmed by both numismatic and epigraphic evidence. Um, the Historia Augusta, which is ex as a rule extremely negative towards Gallienus, uh, goes on to say that all of these things um, Hadrian only did at the height of his good fortune and Antoninus when he had established a lasting peace. And these emperors were so schooled with Greek letters that in the judgment of great men, they were hardly inferior to the greatest scholars. So this is examples of two good Philhellenes. He goes on, for Gallienus was, no one can deny it, preeminent in oratory, poetry, and all the arts. It was his epithalamion that took first place among a hundred poets. It would be a long task to bring together all the verses and speeches which made him illustrious among both the poets and the rhetoricians of his time, but you don't look for the same thing in an emperor um, that you need in an orator or a poet. Here in this one passage, then, we find the two protagonists of this conference, the first Hadrian explicitly, and the second by implication. For who um, could we think of um, with these references to poetic competition, travel to Greece, and qualities more suited to a performer than a ruler than Nero? These two emperors represent in this context the double-edged sword of Philhellenism, Hadrian, the good sober patron of the Greeks, who only turns to such pursuits when the business of governing is finished, and the dissolute performer Nero, whose personal lusts distract him from his duties and bring harm to the res publica. This comparison with Nero is in fact one of the running themes of the Historia Augusta, and so these details and many others have been dismissed as inventions and literary topoi. 
This passage in particular, however, is commonly agreed to depend on the now fragmentary work of Dixippus, the Athenian statesman and historian, who was, of course, particularly interested in imperial visits to Athens. As I said, the connection between Gallienus and Eleusis is confirmed by external sources, and his archonship in 264 is accepted as fact. Whatever literary historical games the Historia Augusta was playing in the fourth century, Gallienus himself was also toying with his public image in the third century. And if, as seems clear, that included conspicuous Philhellenism, then both Hadrian and Nero were the obvious models. But if Gallienus really was engaged in some sort of imitatio Neronis, how can we distinguish this from the polemical fantasies of the Historia Augusta? Some evidence might be offered by the material evidence to which I now turn. Uh, the portraiture of Gallienus is, oh, here, here are the two, the two emperors. Um, the portraiture of Gallienus is divided into two main types. The first uh, co-ruler type here on the right, uh, created early in his reign, and the later sole ruler type created after the death of his father in 260 uh, and used until 268. These images um, uh, have an incredible diversity both between and within the types. Uh, so here's some within the type one, uh, the youthful type uh, on the left in Copenhagen stands out as the production of a Eastern Greek workshop. Um, but the version in Berlin at the center, which is the most frequently reproduced is also quite odd. It's the other three in Rome, uh, Palazzo uh, de Conservatori or Palazzo Caffarelli in the center, uh, Sala Stanza degli Imperatori on the left and Castle Howard in England on the right. This is the real core group and Berlin is actually a bit of an outlier for reasons that I will return to. Um, and in the type two portraits, we can distinguish three uh, variants, the main one at the center in the Museo Palatino, formerly in the Terme, um, the, on the left, Lagos, Portugal, and on the right, a bust in the Louvre. Um, from the very beginning, uh, I, I should emphasize though that all of these share a few iconographical features, um, the long hair, uh, the beard that extends well below the neck, and then also this very distinctive uh, lower lip, the schnabel, uh, the becco di ocello, the, the bird's beak, um, which is uh, represented on, on, on nearly all variants. Um, as I said, these images represent a significant break with those of emperors like Trajan, Decius, or Philip. They're characterized by a certain formal harmony and a return to the sculpting of plastic three-dimensional hair following the more recent fashion for a impressionistic approach. They clearly look back to great images from the past and reformulate their traits for the contemporary more moment. Gerhard Rodenwald thought that the two types made use of distinctly Augustan and Hellenistic classicizing features, calling them der Romische und der Griechische Typus. Uh, the conventional wisdom, including a stimulating 2001 article by Elena Calandra, Il Ritratto di Galieno come palinsesto, see these two images as directly inspired by the charismatic image of Alexander the Great for the sole ruler type, and for the earlier youthful type, Julio-Claudian portraiture, and especially the uh, prima porta type of Augustus. The points of stylistic comparison are obvious, the curved pincer-like locks of hair on the forehead, uh, the ears, and uh, the careful balance of modeled flesh and more abstract geometric structures. This division between an Augustan type and an Alexander type was already made back in the 1940s by Elspeth Dusenberry, uh, who says, quote, the correspondences between these two works are so many that one is tempted to suggest that the master of the Berlin Gallienus used a portrait of Drusus for his model. Well, she couldn't have been uh, aware of how right she was because now we know, uh, thanks to modern research, that the Berlin Gallienus was not just modeled after an early Julio-Claudian portrait, but was actually recarved from a pre-existing portrait dating to the early first century BC. And you can see the evidence of the longer Julio-Claudian locks that are left be here behind the left ear. Um, I should point out, however, um, that Paul Zonker in his work on the statue of Marcus Holconius Rufus from Pompeii uh, notes that from this part of the hair, it's really difficult to tell whether the original sculpture was an early Julio-Claudian or a Neronian uh, portrait. So the question is open. We'll say that this was recarved sometime in the early, or the original dates sometimes early in the, in the first century. 
Um, now, recarving of Gallienus's portraits is actually very, very common. Of the some 17, 18 portraits um, that survive of him, roughly two thirds have evidence of recarving. Um, in many cases, the sculpture is so damaged or the signs of the original, uh, the traces of the original sculpture are no longer preserved. So we can just say it was recarved without uh, saying from what, um, but uh, we see recarvings not only from portraits of the Julio-Claudian period, but also, as I will demonstrate now, uh, from the period of Hadrian. Um, first of all, I should say there are just some broad um, iconographical similarities between the portrait of Hadrian and Gallienus, the, the cap of the hair, the beard. Um, I don't need to labor over this point. Um, this may be directly inspired um, by images of Hadrian. Uh, this colossal head from Ostia, um, which sadly is not on display, um, is, is a bit of a puzzler. It is a portrait of Hadrian. It uh, accurately follows his uh, Chiaramonti type, um, but clearly bears stylistic elements that date it not to the second century, but to the third century. So the, dr the heavy drilling um, of the outline of the hair, the mouth, um, you see on the side these very odd uh, drill marks in the beard, and then these incised eyes, which find no parallel in the sculpture of the second century. Um, I've not been able to examine this sculpture in person, but clearly one of two things has happened. Either a portrait of Hadrian has been kind of refreshed uh, a full century after his death, um, with a sculpture coming in and adding the stylistic traits onto a pre-existing sculpture, or a sculptor has taken the old Chiaramonti type and recreated it. Um, but the dating to the 260s seems to be uh, confirmed by these eyes, which use uh, these two concentric circles and find a perfect parallel in this uh, portrait of Gallienus now in Palazzo Altemps. Um, this bust in the Louvre, uh, the, the bust is ancient, is, is, is modern. Um, the head is ancient, but heavily restored, um, is of the second sole ruler type of Gallienus. Um, when you look at it from the side, uh, from the front, it looks perfectly normal, but when you examine it from the side, you can observe the asymmetries in the depth of the hair. Uh, uh, Marina Prusak and Eric Varner have suggested that the locks of hair at the back behind the left ear reflect the original aspect of this recarved portrait. And indeed, if you look at the back, you can see the left side of the hair at the very back of the nape of the neck um, is consists of these big, thick locks of hair, whereas on the right, you have these smaller, longer locks. Um, and this diversity could be explained by the fact that the, the ones left are left over from an earlier version, uh, which perhaps finds good parallel in Hadrianic sculpture, this one from Tivoli, from the Villa Adriana, and now in the collection of Shelby White in New York. Uh, also from the Louvre, uh, this uh, type two uh, bust of, this is an ancient integral bust uh, of Gallienus, um, which at the rear uh, bears obvious signs of reuse. Uh, again, this statue has been uh, by Klaus Fitchen as well as Prusak and Varner associated with an original version of Hadrian. The traces here are a little bit more difficult to judge. You can see that it's recarved. It's difficult to link it explicitly with Hadrian, but the bust form is very telling. This is um, a bust full of vivacity and plasticity, something that does not date to the third century AD, but rather finds even uh, excellent parallels in the bust forms and plasticity of second century busts. It is a leftover relic inherited from the original version. Um, and finally, this, uh, this Louvre portrait has kind of found its own, it, some uh, scholars consider this to be an, an additional third type, um, which includes two other portraits. One, the Palazzo Corsini head is also clearly recarved. You can see the ears sunken deep into the side of the hair. Um, and the bust here, also a relic, it is the so-called Franzen paludament, the, the, the fringed paludamentum, something typical of the second century AD, but not really found in original sculpture of the third. And finally, uh, the colossal head in Copenhagen, um, which bears traces of reuse. Um, it's been suggested this could be Augustus. I prefer a Hadrianic date. And if it is uh, recarved from a bust of Hadrian, then it preempts the famous recarving of the colossal head Constantine uh, on the Capitol, which since the 1990s has been recognized as a recarved colossal head of the Emperor Hadrian.
Um, one final bit of hadrianic recarving, I'll, I'll uh, pass over in, in very briefly the uh, reliefs from the so-called Arco di Portogallo, now in the Musei Capitolini, um, which uh, Professor La Rocca has uh, shown are not only recarved, but identifiable as from the third century. There have been various proposals uh, of whom, which emperor uh, it was depicted here when Hadrian was recarved into a third century emperor. The most commonly accepted and convincing argument in my mind is still Professor La Lorocas, that this represented Gallienus, and he was shown present at the deification, the consecratio of uh, his mother, Marignana. Um, I will move very quickly through some recarved Hadrian, uh, recarved Nero's, because we find him too uh, recarved in this period. This uh, head of Nero from Egypt was modified in the Gallienic period. It had a, a stippled beard added. The hair at the front of the, the brow was modified and he was given the typical uh, bird's beak uh, lip of Gallienus. It is exceptional to think that this portrait of Nero had sat around in some warehouse for 200 years and then was brought out to represent this new third century emperor. However, clearly emperor uh, images of Nero were still available. Suetonius describes how the um, uh, statues of Nero were brought out long after his death and uh, displayed on the, uh, on the rostra. At the uh, Sebastion in Bubon, we have uh, images of both uh, Gallienus and Nero. Um, and in the private port, in, in small objects for uh, for personal consumption in elite households, this uh, image of the Divus Augustus and Livia and the young Nero was modified in the third century to give it a uh, characteristic, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the, the characteristic hairstyle of third century empresses. Um, I realize that I I'm coming very much to the end of my, my allotted time, and I want to end briefly uh, with a consideration uh, first briefly of the similarities between the images of Gallienus uh, here in an amethyst in the British Museum and Nero, which extend not only to the very full face, but also to the very typical neck beard that uh, Gallienus makes popular and which Nero wears in some of his later portraits. And finally, um, a very obscure reference in the uh, Historia Augusta to a project that probably didn't exist, but is very, very suggestive, a colossal uh, statue of the sun with the features of Gallienus that was projected to be installed on top of the Esquiline Hill. Um, this has been universally rejected as a fantasy of the Historia Augusta, but there are some details in the account which make us think that perhaps there's some truth to it. The first, the location on the Esquiline, where we know that the Horti Licciniani, the, gar the, the private uh, villa, uh, gar gardens of ga um, Gallienus were located. And uh, second of all, the fact that Gallienus was conspicuous with his use of solar imagery, uh, not only on his, uh, on his coinage, um, and, uh, but also uh, in his statuary. This uh, sculpture, which is currently in Albarese, in uh, Grosetto, um, was uh, originally an uh, early imperial statue representing Jupiter, which was recarved sometime in the third century by an emperor who had a beard, not necessarily Gallienus, but perhaps him. And to the image of Gallienus was added, to the image of, uh, of Jupiter was added the uh, rays of the sun god. Um, here, this reconstruction from a recent article by Sam Heijnen. Um, and finally, there are two uh, sculptures of, of Gallienus that survive, which have holes for, uh, ra for a radiate crown. Uh, the one on the Louvre, the holes are no longer visible because they've been uh, filled during a restoration, but they're visible in old archival photographs. This is a very rare form, the, the radiate crown to find on imperial portraiture of this period and is very suggestive of the, uh, the, asp the solar aspirations, something which of course uh, reflects Nero, um, but also perhaps uh, Gallienus, or so, also perhaps Hadrian. Uh, one of the details of the Historia Augusta description of this so-called Colossus Gallieni is that it wasn't just a representation of Sol, but Sol driving his four-horse chariot, the Quadriga. This, of course, uh, is would have been recognized as a reference not to the uh, Neronian Colossus, but to the colossal... Uh, this is my, my final slide. 
the colossal uh, statue of, uh, of Hadrian on top of his mausoleum. So perhaps in this uh, obscure passage of the Historia Augusta, we have hidden a reference not only to Nero, but also to the other great Philhellene, the Emperor Hadrian. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. La ringrazio. La ringrazio molto perché anche perché ci ha portato